this is it. This is the cheapest of the RTX 2070 cards out there. $500. NVIDIA's requirement to send $500 cards to media was discussed in our review. And this is the one we wanted to take apart because the $500 cards are almost certainly always going to use a reference PCB. NVIDIA did not sample us an FE card, and to our understanding, they didn't sample really anyone an FE card. But this has the same PCB. So we can still look at what you would get uh, from an FE card if you wanted to liquid cool it or something like that. And then also, it's 500 bucks is about the price point the 2070 should be anyway. So we're going to take it apart and see what the EVGA RTX 2070 non-branded edition looks like because that's how cheap it is. It doesn't even doesn't say what it is anywhere on there other than RTX 2070, so they don't have a special name for it this time. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Corsair Strafe RGB Mark II mechanical gaming keyboard. The Strafe Mark II uses Cherry MX switches, available in MX Red and MX Silent, and uses the elevated keycap design that has become part of Corsair's keyboard identity. Elevated keycaps make the keyboard much easier to clean with a blast of compressed air and limit dirt buildup. The keyboard use a metal body design and have received praise from us in the past in old reviews for high build quality. Learn more about the Corsair Strafe Mark II at the link in the description below. Technically, EVJ does have a name for this. They call it the RTX 2070 Black, but there's, there's really no way to know that unless you talk to their PR rep and then you figure out that that's the name. So this is the 2070 Black, it's $500 card. There are more expensive models. They have an ultra silent that I think is 550 or 600. But at that point, you start exiting the value argument of the 2070. So 500 is about where it should be. And you get basically a reference card with theoretically a less bad cooler. But we'll have to, I don't know, if we ever get the FE card, we can test it out. But based on previous experience, probably this is going to be less bad than the FE. And we do have thermal data on this in our review. So we're going to take this thing apart. It's pretty straightforward. It's going to be a... Uh, a lot of Phillips drivers, and that's about it. So reasons you would want to do this, of course, for us, we want to see what the PCB and the VRM look like. Are they quality? What kind of VRM are, is NVIDIA using? Because this is a reference model. So even though EVJ is buying the reference board or the design from NVIDIA, uh, we still need to know if it's any good. And we're going to be using our mod mat here to track the screw placement. So you can pick one of those up on store.gamersnexus.net if you want a work surface, a PC building and modding work surface. And we're using, it's not, they're not advertised, but we're using the iFixit toolkit. And we just like to note that because we do think it's one of the better ones. So this is the ProTech toolkit. We'll link both of those below. So this thing, so far it's pretty straightforward. We've got just a lot of Phillips head screws. It's trivial compared to the Founders Edition card. The one difference being that the back plate's kind of odd. So being a $500 card, and this is a really interesting problem that partners face, it's really not possible to put just a straight good cooler on here. A lot of the really good coolers uh, cost about $50 or up, depending on what kind of cooler you're talking about. But when we're talking about, let's say, 1080 Ti class cards, if you were talking about a card that was sort of like ICX class, something like that, uh, ICX, high-end Wind Force, Strix, any of those, you're looking at 50 bucks plus or minus maybe 10 for the coolers. And these... There's really not a lot of room for any manufacturers to price out a cooler because they're spending so much on the GPU itself, of course, and then they're trying to keep a $500 price point. So for the backplate, going back to what I was saying, you end up with this thing where it's like, it's only really there. It doesn't need to be there at all. You just blow air straight through it. Uh, I suppose it looks a bit better, but that's all you end up with for the plate. So it's not really a backplate. It's just a back of heat sink that hangs over PCB plate at this point. And... The PCB, as you've likely noticed by now, is short. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay, got it. I mis misread the screws for a second. So PCB is short, which places the uh, the power pin out right in the middle there, like we've seen on Vega cards and some other cards. I think Polaris cards did that in the past. The GTX 1060 did that as well. So this is not uncommon. The only way to really push the power header over here, and NVIDIA did this with the 1060 reference card or Founders Edition card, is to stick it over there, and then wire, just uh, run some long wires over to the PCB, which uh, is really obnoxious to take apart and completely pointless. So uh, we're glad that EVJ didn't opt to do that here because this, this makes more sense. It's easier to maintain. This sticker, I'll just note, so this is not a warranty void of remove sticker. We've asked EVJ about these in the past. 
uh, even though it says EBJ everywhere, they're not going to void your warranty if you have clearly tampered with it. Although you could remove it easily if you wanted to. Uh, so they're not going to avoid it just because there's a hole in that. If you, for example, stuck a water cooler on this PCB, it's a, a tamper seal so they can figure out what you've changed. And what they do with that data, I don't know. I, I would, if we're hoping they're only doing good things with it, then it would be that they are trying to figure out where to troubleshoot problems. But it could also be used to figure out if there's reason to void a warranty, I suppose. We just we don't actually know 100% what they're doing. Uh, so yeah, screw, nut and screw on the IO plate, which is pretty common practice. It's probably, there's not one here, but just a screw there. At this point, we can probably separate them without removing the screws from that weird back plate. And it's got a base plate that's separating as well. We have a combined power cable in here that you can see, so I need to disconnect that in the safest way possible. Which is going to be avoiding pulling on the cables. There we go. Looks clean. Cool. So we did not break anything. That's good. <laughs> it's always a goal. Uh, so for this, if you do take one of these apart, just stick a fingernail under the corner here and pull. Don't pull on the cables. It's very easy to rip them out. So here's the card. We've already done thermal testing on this. I'll oh, mind you, we have uh, testing with stock paste and testing with aftermarket solutions in the main review if you want to see those. And then we also tested with, uh, well, in the future with thermocouples under the base plate because, uh, I mean, that's why we're taking this apart right now. So, okay, base plate can come off at this point. Let's remove that and then look at it further. Okay, pretty straightforward. So what we end up with is a flat base plate. There's no real service area there. And the base plate is aluminum. So it's got that going for it. It is conductive. It's just not dissipative in any meaningful way. And that's sitting with, uh, it's got a hole for the inductor line right here, which we'll look at. And this, now, looking at the PCB, this explains partly why we're limited in power target, 214%. It's a very weak power target, and it's not the strongest VRM, but we'll have Buildzoid look at it as well. And uh, let's pull some of the pads off. So it should be, how much? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, eight memory modules as expected. Let's just remove these for now. I need a spudger. So this is, I fix it spudger that they actually they include one with the Protect toolkit too, but um, we like these for removing thermal pads. It's a good way to kind of prevent them from tearing apart as you remove them or stretching. That's the bigger problem. If you pull at it, it'll stretch. And if you need to reapply it, that becomes increasingly difficult as it stretches out. So I'm just going to put this over here so I can kind of remember where it goes. And I might as well reveal the die. We haven't seen this die yet, so that'll be new. Typically, EVGA uses Shinetsu paste for some of their cards. We don't know what they're using on this one. It is a lower end model, uh, but they did change their paste for the 20 series. It's normally a non, or well, fairly non curing compound, but uh, time will tell how it holds up. We don't know what they're using on this one though. But that's the 2070 die. First time we've, we've seen this in person. This is the TU-106-400-A1, and normally the A1 is just a revision number, so that's really insignificant at this point. So TU-106-400 is the GPU, or the silicon. I'm just going to clean off the base plate, or the cold plate as well. This is a nickel-plated copper cold plate. So for the heat pipes here going into the plate, uh, the most important thing with heat pipes is not how many there are, despite what manufacturers like to use for marketing. It's where do they contact? And in this instance, there are large heat pipes. We can measure those. Those look like probably 10 millimeter. That's 10. So those are 10 millimeter heat pipes. There are three of them, of course, for the GPU and actually for the whole card. For the whole card, there are three. And they do go right down the center. So you've got good contact on one and then maybe half of each of these two here you end up with a bit of a radius issue uh, or the chamfered edge. You lose all of your contact there. So hopefully it's soldered to the cold plate at that point to, to increase the thermal transfer. But that's why sometimes you'll see a bunch of four or six, typically six millimeter pipes uh, instead of larger, fewer larger pipes, just because it's better 
overall contact, depending on how it's built. But uh, they've got three of those on here, adding thermal paste to the mod mat. <laughs> With all the other thermal paste, it needs a cleaning. This thing's been through like probably a year of use at this point, including my literal blood on the mat and also lots of water cooling spills. So it's durable. It'll hold up to a lot. You should buy one on, on store.gamersnexus.net. Uh, so that's the cooler. What we end up with is aluminum fins, as always. Some of these are L-shaped fins on the bottom, which is a blockage to airflow, depending on what it's sitting over. So what is that sitting over? That's going to be sitting over the inductors, which are probably the hottest part of the VRM with the MOSFETs, a very close second. And having those L-shaped fins, although it blocks airflow, will allow for direct contact between the thermal pad and the fin stack with the inductors. And that is actually more valuable than allowing airflow to get down there uh, for the most part. Although airflow is just fine if you take the cooler off and blast it with air. And then let's just go ahead and remove this back plate just out of curiosity. And after that, we can look at the VRM. And this requires a smaller bit if you're keeping track at home. Oh, it's plastic. This is actually a plastic uh, back plate with rubber bumpers on it, probably for vibration or spacing. So this actually does nothing other than brands the card and maybe looks cool to some people. So there's the rest of the cooler then. Pretty basic. It's got two fans on it and a couple of 10 millimeter heat pipes. As for the cold plate, so it's a, a copper cold plate, nickel plated copper. Heat pipes are copper, nickel plated as well. And that's important this time because it's a cheap card, so you never know, it might go aluminum. But these are indeed copper. And then they also have this gate they've added on to hide the cable a bit, and they tape the, the cable down. So just some level of detail notes for you. Uh, cable's not using all the pins either, so I believe they could fit either LED functionality or maybe another fan into this header if they wanted to. You can see they're only using about two-thirds, 60% of the cable, of the header, I should say. Uh, this card has no LEDs, so that may be what it was originally intended for in higher-end models or something. So that's all I have on the cooler. It's really very basic. The base plate also very basic. It's just, it's just an aluminum plate. The VRM is using uh, on semi NCP 302155 MOSFETs and some cheap inductors. And that's for the V-Core VRM. So no doubling scheme or anything here, I don't think. Let's just double check. OK, so here's some of the controllers on the back. So for the controllers, we've got a UP9512R right there. That's what that one is. And Bill Zoid will talk about this stuff in his PCB analysis if he does one for us, talk about the capabilities of this thing current-wise. And there's also an on-semi brick over here which is a 45491 on semi on the back for shunt resistors. There's this shunt resistor here. So this is a 5 milliohm shunt. And there's probably only one except for the one for the uh, PCIe slot. There's another one. This shunt resistor right here, the R005, that almost certainly goes to the PCIe slot. And then the one on the back probably goes to the pinout. But let's just validate that. So this is pretty simple. We're just going to do a continuity check. And the purpose of this is if you want to do a shunt mod, you could do it with liquid metal. We've never really advised that approach. You gain a bit from it in terms of lifting the power target. The shunt resistors, and this stuff most of you probably know at this point, but these little things, the shunt resistors right there, those are used to uh, control the card's power consumption. And if you short it to a certain degree, you can trick the card into drawing a bit more power. The trouble is if you short it too directly, like with a uh, short wire, just bridging it, then what will happen is the card will enter a safety mode, go into 2D clocks, and run at 300 megahertz. But if you put liquid metal on it, uh, which again, we don't necessarily advise, the liquid metal will uh, will provide that, uh, that short you need in order to draw a bit more power. It's just better ways to do it. Um, Der Bauer and Bill Duet have both talked about those if you're interested. For example, on some cards, you could piggyback another shunt resistor on top of it. But Der Roman Der Bauer did run in trouble with that with this generation. So let's do a resistance check. We're going to check 
versus we have an e a, a PCIe power pin out here on our mod mat. So it's a six pin, that's what we're tracking against. Although eight pin's really not any different. We have one of those there too. It just adds a sense and a ground line. That's what the plus two are for. Uh, no 12 volt is added. So we're going to check the, we can probably do this the easy way on the back of the board. Check the shunt resistor versus one of the uh, 12 volt lines is what we're interested in. So what we're going to do, because this card is upside down and we're measuring the back, the top becomes the bottom for the pinout. Uh, typically, if you're measuring the top, you kind of get in there between the pins and you're checking the ones on the inside line, not the outside line. Flip it over though, and what we're measuring is going to be at the top instead. So that we're taking a 12 volt line here, and if you look at our mod mat over here, you can see the PCIe 6 pin pinout. It's the same as the 8 pin, so it doesn't matter which one it is. 8 pin just adds a ground and a sense pin. And we're measuring against 12 volt. So on the card, we take a 12 volt here and measure that versus the shunt resistor and we should get continuity. So you see 0 0.1 ohms on the multimeter. That means we're continuous. And that means that this shunt resistor corresponds to this power header. So if you wanted to short the shunt on your 2070, this would be the one to do. Uh, just to give you an example of what you'd see if it's not continuous, I'm going to probe a, a completely unrelated pin and you'll get a very different number that generally just keeps climbing or fluctuating. So those would not be continuous, which is what you would see if you measured the wrong shunt resistor. And then this one, if, if I had the patience to do it and we had a pin out uh, that was easier to work with, you could measure this shunt resistor versus the uh, line, 12 volt line on the PCIe slot and you would see the same thing. So do not, don't short that one. That would be bad. You'll pour, you'll, you'll pull too much power through your motherboard and that would be inadvisable. So that's what we have for the card. Uh, as for the VRM layout, we'll have Buildzoid look at that, but we've got six power stages here, and then these two would be for the memory, so it's got a two-phase memory VRM, and that is using what looks to be uh, FDPC parts, so it's using an FDG41CE is the part, uh, or well, 50... 501850, oh no, wait, 50185G. I really wish my eyes could zoom in. So yeah, two-phase memory VRM, and then we'll have Buildzoid look at the rest, but that is all the parts on the card. So that's the card. It's really very simple. It's a small PCB. We're not gonna bother water cooling this one or liquid cooling it because we kind of learned about that with the 2080 Ti, and with this generation, unlike previous generations, thermal limitations aren't really the main concern it's power limitations. And if you open up GPU-Z or some other monitoring application while you're running this card, constantly the perf cap is going to be, a perf cap reason will be power. And at 114% maximum offset when overclocked, even if you don't offset the clock speeds and you just do the power percent increase, it's still perf cap of power, not even VREL on this one. So it is very power limited, but uh, we'll talk about the VRM separately, and the, the cooler itself we would have talked about, will have talked about by now in our review. So check the review for cooler performance notes, how this thing does versus the VRM versus the GPU. We have all that stuff, how uh, EVGA stock paste is versus aftermarket. We've got all of it. Check the review for that. As always, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to support us directly. Find one of our mod mats, for example, that was featured in this video. Or uh, we'll link the iFixit kit below. Not an advertiser, but we do like the ProTech toolkit, so check that out. And then patreon.com slash gamersnexus helps out directly there as well. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.